As the crisis in Syria looms on the minds of many people in America, I think this is a good time for us to explore the Catholic Church's teaching on war so that we can inform our own conscience and enter into a discussion in the public sphere. When we look at the Church's teaching on war, I think a good starting point is to turn to Blessed Pope John Paul II, who happened to state that war is always a defeat for humanity. In other words, there's never a time when we can say that war is a good thing. Now, that being said, we also don't claim that the avoidance of war is a moral absolute. What I mean by this is there are certain moral teachings that the Church says are absolutes. So we can think to something like abortion, for example, and the Church says that's never justified, so it always has to be avoided. War is not one of those things. In fact, Blessed John Paul II even noted that there might be times when war is unavoidable. The Catholic Church has had a long-standing tradition or long-standing teaching known as the Just War Doctrine. It dates back to Augustine in the 4th century, and it talks about when it might be justifiable to enter into a war. And the Just War Doctrine has four basic points. I'm going to outline those points and then talk about each one of them. The first point is that for a nation to enter into war, there has to be a threat against that nation, and that threat has to be certain, lasting, and grave. The second point is that all other means of avoiding war have to either have been exhausted and proved ineffective, or they have to be impractical. The third point is that in entering into war, there has to be a real prospect of success. And the final point is that when you enter into war, the evil that you commit by entering into war cannot outweigh the evil of not entering into war, or the evil that would be perhaps inflicted upon you. So let's look at those four points. The first one says that there has to be a threat that is certain, lasting, and grave. This means that the threat has to be real. It can't be theoretical. It has to be lasting. It can't be something that's just a temporary thing, such as a temporary embargo or something like that. And it has to be grave. It has to be something that's really going to impact a nation. The second criteria or criterion is that the other means have to have proven to be ineffective or impractical. So this means when we think about this, we think in terms of diplomacy. Are there any other solutions to this conflict before we go into war? And if so, let's explore those before we go into war. The third point is that there has to be a prospect of success. So you can't enter into a suicide mission, so to speak. You can't enter into a war knowing that you're not going to win the war. The final point is that the evil that you commit by entering into war cannot outweigh the evil of avoiding war, or the evil that would be inflicted perhaps by the aggressor. Furthermore, I would add a corollary to that, which would say that when you enter into war, you can't use a means that's going to inflict greater damage. So we can't say, well, let's just go over there and bomb them with nuclear bombs, for example. This is why the U.S. bishops in 1983 actually said nuclear war is always off the table because it's always going to create a greater evil than whatever it is that you're trying to avoid. So you have to use means that are proportional, would be the the language we would use, or that are going to create a lesser evil than doing nothing would. So now, when we look at these criteria, one of the first things that should come to our mind is that these are quite subjective. I mean, who defines, who gets to decide what is grave? Who decides what determines lasting? Who decides whether or not um, all other means have been exhausted or are impractical at this point? Who determines whether or not something has a legitimate prospect of success? What is that? Is that a 50% prospect of success? Is it a 90% threshold? What is that? Well, ultimately, we don't have a defined black and white line on those. The church teaches that the responsibility for making those decisions lies with the people with whom the common good is entrusted. So in the case of the United States, there would be the president and Congress, for example. So they're the ones who ultimately have to make that decision. Now, this in no way exonerates the rest of us and makes us say, oh, good, I don't, I'm off the hook, I don't have to do anything. Not at all. No, what we have to do is make sure that our leaders are, in fact, using these criteria when exploring the decision of whether or not to enter into war. Another thing that we need to do is we need to look beyond these criteria to something to criteria to something that Pope Benedict XVI, now Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, said when he addressed the United Nations in 2008. In 2008, Pope Benedict XVI added what could be considered another point. It's, it's not technically, but another point to be considered certainly when entering into war. And that is that we have a responsibility for other nations, especially, he said, 
when the other nations, other governments are incapable of protecting and defending themselves, or when they've declared war on their own people, that the rest of the world community has a responsibility to intervene. You know, this really goes back to that story of Cain and Abel, that notion of, am I my brother's keeper? When Cain, for those who don't recall the story, murdered his brother Abel, the Lord came to him and said, Cain, where's Abel? And Abel, or Cain responded saying, what, am I my brother's keeper? And the response that the Lord gives is, as a matter of fact, you are. So there's a sense in which we are responsible for the well-being of one another. And so when we see a government is unable to protect itself, or when it's declaring war on its own people, we have a responsibility to intervene. Now, this does not mean that we have a responsibility to intervene with war. Okay, so let's just be clear on that. Intervention can occur in many different ways, through diplomacy, through embargoes. There's, there's many different ways to intervene. So we're not saying that we have to go to war. We don't have a, an obligation to go to war, so to speak. But we do have an obligation to promote peace, not only for ourselves, but for the entire world. So this becomes a hot topic of conversation in the United States, because so often we hear people saying, well, should we really be the world's policemen? Shouldn't we just worry about our own problems? We've got enough of them. Um, and yes, we should worry about our own problems, but this doesn't mean that we don't have any concern for the rest of the world's problems as well. So it is important that we understand that. Now, when we look at this situation in Syria, certainly we understand that our president and Congress need, are the ones who have collected the intelligence, the, um, the information as to whether these this would be a just um, war to enter into based on the criteria that we've outlined. But we also need to form our own consciences and say, do we believe our leaders are using these criteria, or are they using some other criteria that may or may not be proper criteria to use. For example, we can think of the way in which the U.S. bishops really stood up to President George W. Bush when he entered into Iraq. If you recall, when President Bush entered into Iraq, he stated that, I'm doing this as a preemptive strike. Well, clearly that's a violation of the first principle, which says that there has to be a certain threat, not a theoretical threat, but a certain threat. In addition, it violates Catholic social doctrine, which says a preemptive war is never justified. And so the bishop stood up. They didn't say, it's no longer your role to make this decision. They understood that it is his role. But they said, you're not using the right criterion. You're not using this first criterion that we pointed out, which is that there has to be a threat that is certain. <laughs> Instead, you're using some other criterion or criteria in making this decision, and we reject that notion. That's the way in which we need to enter into this discussion with Syria. I think we need to look at the criteria outlined by the Catholic Church. We need to say, is each one of these criteria being met? And if so, then we can entrust that our leaders are in fact making a good decision. If not, we need to hold our leaders accountable. And we do that by entering into a public discourse, whether it be through articles, whether it be through protests, or whatever means are available to us, to make sure that we are entering into a situation in a manner that is just. So as we look at Syria, we look at the civil war, certainly we realize that something needs to be done. The question is, what is it that needs to be done? And here we can turn to the Catholic Church's teaching to form our conscience so that we can say, we know that when we enter into a decision that we're using the right criteria so that we can promote peace and justice throughout the world.